Good afternoon, everyone. You are very welcome to the International Men's Day Webinar 2023, Men Making a Difference. The panel would be delighted to receive any questions you may have. Please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your PC laptop screen. If you are using an iPad, you will find this feature located at the top of your screen. Without further ado, I will now hand you over to your host for today, Lorcan Brennan from the Men's Development Network. Thank you. Hello, everybody. You're really welcome. And thank you for joining us for this special webinar, which is focused on International Men's Day. Uh, we see the sign that we have up there, Men Making a Difference. That's our caption for today. And we're glad that you've decided to come along and be with us on this journey because we know that Men's International Day or International Men's Day is not until Sunday the 19th, but there's lots of people and organizations that are already out of the blocks and they're starting conversations in relation to marking and celebrating the day. What we hope to do is bring you some light and color and celebration of the positive masculinities that men can bring into the world. And we're gonna do that for the next hour and 15 minutes. So we're so glad that you're here with us today. Now, to begin, we're gonna start by showing a little promo as we often do to remind us exactly maybe why we're here and why we're marking this international event. So when you're ready there, folks, show us our little promo and off we go. Thank you so much, Dan Marie, for bringing us that, the six pillars and that question at the end, are we making a difference? Well, folks, I think the people who are bringing to you today are certainly making a difference. And you will see that through the conversations we're about to have. I think it's Oprah that says, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And I think there's some truth in that. Well, what we hope to do for the next hour or so is we hope to bring you the voices of men who, through adversity or opportunity, or different aspects of their lives have responded in a civic minded and a generous way to make a difference to the lives of others. Now, across the webinar, we're gonna have six different people on. We're gonna have three interviews. And then of course, we're going to have our panel discussion, which we always have as well. And so we hope you really are gonna stay with us because we've some really, really interesting people along with us for today. Now, I always use this opportunity just at the beginning to remember especially the partners who make this happen. And we have, of course, the Men's Development Network. We have the HSE. We have the Southeast Technological University and we have the Men's Health Forum in Ireland. And together, I suppose, as partners over the last number of years, we've been bringing this series of webinars uh, along across the years and marking men's health and growing awareness in relation to that. Later on, we're going to have Fergal along as always. Fergal Fox comes and he'll tell us all we need to know about what's happening in HSE land and indeed beyond that as well. So please uh, wait with us for that as well. And as already has been said, we have our Q&A and we have people in the background who are going to be minding us. And if you have any questions that you'd like to put to the panel, please send them in there for us. But I already see our John here on the screen. Uh, John, you're very welcome. John Wall, he's living in exile in Clare, we'll say at the moment, that's where he is. But um, John, you're really, really welcome. And give a little bit of a brief background because John, in 2019, John was living a blissful kind of a life, married and looking forward to all kinds of wonderful things. But then John, you had a diagnosis of stage four cancer. And that came into your kitchen, as I say, and it was life changing and life changing in many different ways. The reason you're here with us today is, first of all, I suppose, to talk about that role that you've taken on in advocacy for men to get more men to be out there and aware of our health and well-being. But, John, tell us, first of all, to live in your life 2019 and suddenly you get a diagnosis. What was it like? It was uh, back in 2017. It was, uh, I, I guess, life to that point. I didn't really appreciate uh, what was right in front of me. I was chasing life, chasing career. 
busy. And in July of uh, 2017, I went to my GP with uh, an innocuous enough pain in my leg. And that was it. I didn't think anything more of it. But uh, within several hours, it was blindingly obvious to those uh, that were looking after me that there were some serious difficulties uh, with my own health. And it turned out that I had advanced uh, prostate cancer. Very aggressive. Apart from that pain in my leg, I had absolutely no symptoms. And uh, that's key, in, I guess, in, in my message, in that uh, don't always judge a book by the cover in terms of your own body. Because uh, even as, as recently as yesterday evening, I heard the story of a, a middle-aged man who's got uh, aggressive stage three prostate cancer, and uh, he only got diagnosed very, very recently, absolutely no symptoms. And it's it's one of these diseases that uh, it's uh, it can, you know, it can manifest itself in many different ways, but most of us, we don't even know it. Um, but a simple blood test, uh, in my case, would have uh, avoided the, the diagnosis that I got. So... Um, I guess initially I was told uh, palliative chemotherapy, and that's all that could be done for me just to get my affairs in order. So as you can imagine, that came as a bit of a shock. But uh, thankfully, uh, that didn't come to pass because I'm, I'm here talking to you now and in very good health and off all treatment for the last uh, two years. So I, I guess one of the messages I'd like to get across too is about uh, living with an advanced uh, health issue, in my case, an advanced cancer diagnosis, that uh, it is possible with uh, the support of others to uh, to live positively, live well, live healthily and live happily with uh, a significant health issue in your life. I, I find that I live a better life now than I ever did prior to my diagnosis because I appreciate it. Uh, when you're given a wake up call and told that, uh, you know, my the last time I asked, actually, um, how long I had left was they gave me up until last January, 12 months. I don't ask anymore, but the important part of that is I don't need to. I don't feel that compelling need uh, to ask how long because I have the rest of my life. That's how long I have, the same as absolutely everybody else. We have the rest of our lives out there to live, to enjoy, to make the most of, to seek help when we need it, talk. And uh, that's a very important part of, of this as well, in that uh, as men, we're getting a lot better, uh, for example, this webinar, at just opening up and talking about our health, our mental health, our physical health, Yeah. Uh, in terms of prostate cancer, erectile dysfunction is a huge issue that uh, not many are comfortable, or certainly weren't when I was diagnosed, uh, comfortable talking about. And if I had had someone to talk to at the time, other than medics, I think it would have benefited me enormously. Um, fortunately, there are, that conversation has, has started. And uh, whilst people like myself were not medics, we just share our life experience. And that's very important, too. And I don't I never give advice as to what to do. I can just let people know what I have done and what has helped me. Yeah. And that's uh, apart from helping others, that helps me. I find it therapeutic in itself. John, I mean, to get that kind of news, and as I say, you've really told the story in a couple of sentences in relation to the way you responded. Not all of us, maybe as men, might respond like that. And, you know, I, when I talked to you earlier and when we were talking about such a diagnosis, you know, for men, sometimes the fear of knowing how am I going to deal with this if I know this bad news? You know, for maybe a man who would be watching around anything, you know, that he's a fear or a concern, you know, having the emotional intelligence to be able to deal with that within the context of yourself or your family was that must have been a real challenge for you, because I, here you are and you're, you're speaking with such light and, and synergy and energy, you know, but it must have been really challenging. What would you say to that man about that fear of knowing maybe, you know, where you might need yeah. support? It, there was a fear, but there's also, I think, uh, inbuilt in all of us, uh, there's a coping mechanism. And I was blissfully unaware of the, the magnitude of what was happening at the time. I went into to, uh, the, the coping mechanism that I had, uh, that I had at the time was just, I, I, I didn't delve too deep into, I suppose, the repercussions of what was happening. I just immersed myself in the moment and tried to, to look after myself, to to let others look after me and uh, 
it, it, it didn't have the enormous impacts looking back now than I would have envisaged. Uh, I dealt with that afterwards. That came when, when actually, when the uh, I had chemotherapy first, then I went abroad for surgery, came back for, for radiotherapy. And when that treatment stopped, then there was a void, then there was a vacuum. And then I began to realize, well, what next? And then I started asking the question of how long? And uh, it, that's the period that I found difficult, not the original diagnosis. And I think that's that seems to be true for a lot of people that I've conversed with over the years, that there's, uh, when, when, when everything stops and you're left there yourself and your own thoughts. Yeah. And that can be very, very difficult. But very, very fortunately in my life, I had uh, I became very friendly with people in uh, male and female uh, that were in similar circumstances. And we we helped each other through some very difficult times. We we uh, we learned from each other's experience. Again, I think that that conversation is really, really important and just we're there for each other and learning from each other. Can I ask you, John, you know, you met the Marie Keating Foundation then. And I mean, I hear in you, you know, the story of your advocacy coming through very strong. You obviously met other people then as well and other men. You know, what was that like for you and how important was that in in the call on your own life, even though in illness and coming to some kind of recovery for that time to be able to be an advocate? Was it an important part of your own wellness? It was, yeah. It means that it, for me, that the diagnosis counts for something. And when you see a uh, change in terms of uh, whether that be policy change, whether that be something as simple as having a chat with uh, with another guy that uh, is going through a similar experience that I went through in, uh, years ago. And to see, I, I suppose, if you're able to help somebody or feel you're helping some, somebody, that's therapy in itself for me. And it just makes everything worthwhile. There's a reason for everything. And I guess I got caught up in the, the advocacy space. I have no kind of formal training or it just it just happened. But I enjoy it. And that's the thing as well. It gives me, uh, it's added another dimension to my life, but it's also brought people into my life, friends that will be friends for life. Unfortunately, some no longer with us, but I carry those, I treasure those memories. Uh, I bring them forward with me, but I, I like life has changed, but for the better. And it's ironic, but I wouldn't change a single thing. Uh, I look back on everything that has happened and I would not change it because the person that I am now and the life that I have is far far better than ever I could have envisaged prior to me diagnosed and I think that's something really a lot of us have to go through to to be able to say something like that and it's not I don't wish I wouldn't wish this on anybody yeah but it's just the way that I feel that yeah I wouldn't change anything because I'm I'm happy I'm content and life is uh, extraordinarily good and has been good to me so and I can, I, can see, I can see that on you today here. John, look, we're living in a time and uh, we're living through a time that the world is a troubled place. And, you know, I was saying at the start, as Oprah says, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And positive masculinities and expressions of it, you know, you know, do you see that you are part of that, the expression of of the positive masculinities and how how important that is in the world for us as men and for younger men, especially to see that. You know, somebody once said, don't be defined by what happens to you, but be defined by your response to what happens to you. And be part of that advocacy is really vital, really, isn't it? Yeah, definition uh, is very important. And uh, I suppose my cancer does not define who I am. What defines who I am is me, uh, is the, the person that I am, the man that I am, and the positive outlook that I have. And I suppose uh first and foremost i'm i'm comfortable with that i'm very very comfortable uh my my mantra for the last several years has been carpe diem and it's it's very very simple and uh, a very good friend of mine um uh, laura brennan years ago she said uh she gave a bit of advice and it was very very simple it just said live your best life it couldn't be more profound but it couldn't be more simple and that's exactly what i'm doing i'm living my best life but i'm happy I'm happy with me. Um, I'm happy with the man that I've become. And uh, I'm happy with, I suppose, how I've used uh, life experience to shape my own life and hopefully uh, help others who are uh, experiencing difficulty as a result of, of um, health issues in their lives. Um, 
it's about working together. And it's about a, an open, honest conversation, uh, talking about um, whether that be body parts, how we feel. And again, something that's that's very, very simple that I wouldn't have paid much attention to years ago, but it's okay not to be okay. In that I have bad days, despite the positive outlook and you know the, the smile and all the rest of it. I have bad days and I expect bad days, but it's how I deal with them. And um, it's uh, it's it's refreshing for me to be able to start and say, you know what, I, I don't feel so good today, but I know tomorrow will be better. Yeah. Um, last week I had a, I had one or two bad days. Yeah. And the first time it had happened in a while, but it didn't get on top of me. He said, "Okay, this too will pass," and it did. Yeah. And it's been absolutely fine since. And I look forward, not back. And you're here today, just very finely. We believe it or not, we're on time already. We're gone on time, John. And thank you so much for coming and sharing with us that light in the midst of challenge for International Men's Day. But for a man, maybe that might be watching this. So somebody's watching out, and they're saying, you know, they're concerned about something. What's your word to them in relation to getting to that service or making that phone call or talking to that person they need to talk to? What is your word for that? Vicky Phelan once said, trust your gut. If you think there's something wrong, whether there is or whether there is not, don't just leave it, deal with it. That could be uh, talking to a family member or a friend, picking up the phone, but do not just let it lie. Um, uh, and as well as that, there doesn't have to be something wrong in order to look after yourself. Very, very quickly, um, I equate um, the way we look after ourselves as men. Sometimes we... we uh, we, we, we service our cars regularly. If uh, a certain amount of mileage is done, we go to the garage, we get the car serviced. But we wait for something to go wrong with our bodies before we present ourselves to a GP or a hospital or whatever the case may be. You don't always have to have something wrong. It's just about regular checkups. Once a year, when you get to a certain age, go to your GP, get your bloods taken, just have a service, have, allow your body to be serviced once a year and just look after yourselves mentally and physically. Don't take it for granted. I did. I also got lucky in, in that where I am now. But just don't take your good health for granted. Mind yourselves. John, thank you for that and for being with us this morning. And uh, we really, really appreciate it and hope to talk to you again soon uh, and follow up with you and meet you somewhere across the country at some stage as well. Really, really appreciate it. So go well thank and, and mind Thank you for the opportunity and best of luck. Thank you very much. That's John Wall and what a story and what a remarkable man uh, really is an example of if you can't see it, you can be, it, you know, so there's somebody who is literally an advocate for men's health. We're going on to another man who I got to know over the years called Noel Richardson. And Noel, if you want to come in beside us for the introduction as well, Dr. Noel Richardson, uh, we know each other a good few years, Noel, and I asked you to come in today to be part of this conversation as well, because all things men's health you've been part of on the island of Ireland and beyond very much part of the very first piece of research that was done back getting inside men's health that led to a national policy. You were part of the European context, you're part of training, research, you know, facilitation. And we're going to be showing something later on, the Engage National Men's Health Training Programme Connecting with Men. Uh, and we'll show a video about that. You're very much at the heart of that as well. But also Noel, an advocate in every way across those areas. And then in 2011, I think it was, a diagnosis of Parkinson's. But before we talk about you know, your, 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 the health issue that came into your life unexpected, uh, you know, in relation to International Men's Day itself, how important is it as somebody who's right at the centre of men's health in Ireland that we even mark events like this in health and well-being and we try and look at the men making a difference? Thanks, Lorcan, for, for that introduction. International Men's Day is so important and it's, it's really important as is International Men's Health Week in June. Um, it's really important for a couple of reasons. One is that it, it sends out a, a marker that men's health is important, that it's something to be valued. And it also serves as a call to action to men and boys in Ireland and, and around the world that, that to take stock of their health. That, And I keep saying this to any groups I work with, what, what could be more important than health? Yeah. And it's, it's a simple, simple question. Yeah. But really, and the answer is nothing. I, well, I've, I've yet to come across somebody who can tell me that anything is more important than health. And really, that that's that's if if, if, if there was one message from International Men's Day, that would be it for me. 
that you know if, if we if we take stop and take stock of all that's important in our lives, and as John talked about there, very often men can be consumed with pursuing success, whatever success means. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's about recalibrating what, what success means and putting health right at the center of what's important to us as men and, and not waiting till, till things go pear you know, before we start to take action. You've been very much at the heart of framing and reframing the conversations around health for men in Ireland and especially the way you've approached research with other partners uh, and trying to bring what we call a strengths-based approach, especially to how we engage with men for our health and well-being, you know. Is that working, Noel? You know, or, or is there how where are we on the scale of things in Ireland? Is there a lot more to do, or are we really getting there around key parts to do with raising awareness and actions for men's health? Uh, I, th- I think we're we're doing very well, really, um, and we've had good resources put into men's health, but we've also had really good people and really good partnerships, and all of the programs that have happened. If you take say programs like Sheds for Life or Farmers of Hearts or Men yeah. in the Move or uh, on firm ground, the Corridor Project with the Construction Centre recently, they're all underpinned by really strong partnerships between the health HSC, you know, universities who are conducting the research and evaluation, and also NGOs and other organisations. And I think we're the sum is often greater than the or the what's that phrase about this greater than the sum of the parts. Greater than the sum of the parts. Sorry, thanks, Lord. Yeah. I think that that's really applies very much to men's health in Ireland. Yeah. We work very collegiately and collaboratively um, and a lot of the success is founded on strong partnership. Yeah. You know, the HSC has been central to that, but it's not just the HSC, it's all the other organisations as well. Yeah. Um, and when Vidya Neil often talks about when the policy was launched in 2010 and coincided with the downturn in the economy, yeah. but in many ways it, it forces us to be creative and to work co- collaboratively together yes um and the, that strength based approach that you talked about was very much embedded in the in the from the start yeah. if you look at the consultation process that underpinned the national mental health policy yeah. it's based on the Ottawa charter it wasn't about a medical model of health it was about social determinants of health it was about capacity building it was about community engagement it was about you know yeah. targeting hard to reach groups of men Right. So it was very much a holistic model of health, uh, and embedded in that was a strengths-based approach, which I think has served us really well. Now, a strengths-based approach, no, that's in the p- policy and practice, and you have it right across your own practice in all that you do. Personally, you know, you have it in your professional life and you're working, and then, like you happened in 2011, you got the beginnings of a, a diagnosis. You knew there was something wrong. A very fit, athletic man involved in sport very out there and then something happens and it brings you you know and your own story and your interest in health from the outside to the inside for yourself what was that like initially you know and your own response to that what was it like as a man yeah it's a really good question Morgan um I mean I was flummoxed really when I got the diagnosis I mean I just didn't see something of that coming and listen to John earlier, I mean, a lot of what he said resonates with me as well. Um, as you said, I was I was a runner, I was quite fit, I was still quite fit, but, um, I, you know, I just, I, I didn't expect to see this coming. Um, and I suppose the first thing that struck me was, it's much easier to dole out advice than, than to try to take it on yourself. Yeah. So I wasn't very good at it. But it was a bit tricky because the diagnosis initially was, it looks like it's Parkinson's can't be absolutely sure. And then I got second and third opinions. So I didn't come out with Parkinson's as it were. Initially, there was a period of about 18 months where I sat with it and dwelt in it. And I felt a little bit like a fraud at that stage because here I was in, on the one hand as an advocate and as a someone working in men's health that was encouraging men to go and seek help and to go to their doctors. Yeah. And here I was going about my business on a day-to-day basis without having said it to anyone outside of really close family. Yeah. So um, so really, it's kind of that grieving process that there's that anger, frustration, depression, I think, for a period. And then you come out of it to a, to a period of acceptance. And the key learnings for me have been 
you know, accepting that vulnerability is part of life, that a lot of us think we're on this train to success, but, but really something like a diagnosis like this forces you to really calibrate everything. Yeah. Um, and you can't control everything. You have to accept the reality of this, but then you, you go about living your best life. And it's brought me incredible clarity in terms of what's important, incredible gratitude in terms of really appreciating the blessings I have in terms of family, the four daughters, a really close relation with them, with my wife as well, Neve, with really incredible colleagues and friends who are there to support me. So it's not just all about me forging ahead on my own. Yes. It's been a great clarity in terms of, of of leaning into people and accepting the support that's that's there. Yeah. Um, and Parkinson is a pain in the backside, but like John said, it doesn't define me either. Yeah. Um, and I get up and go about my business every day, in a, in a very with, with with a greater clarity in life and a greater perspective in life. But I don't think I would have got without Parkinson's. Can I ask you this, Noel? And we've only a few moments to go as well. Um, and thanks for sharing that. I was to say, I think I maybe was somewhere along the line one day and you were at a conference and I, I noticed that you moved into that area of advocacy that you're just talking about now, where you spoke about for probably the first time I had heard you in the context of working for men's health and awareness, you spoke about your own Parkinson's. You know, for, for being an advocate now, you integrate your story and the story of what you've just talked about, what you're so grateful for in the context of your health and well-being, even with carrying a diagnosis. That's really important to you, isn't it, in your own advocacy work now? Yeah, I mean, I don't see myself as as a champion or as a, a leader in Parkinson's. My, my, my experience is, is, can be very different to others with Parkinson's. Yeah. But, but I... I am very clear about this is who I am now. Parkinson's is part of who I am. Um, and it's important that I am open and honest in how I'm dealing with that. And at the moment, things are good. Next year or five years' time, you might be different. You know, it presents different challenges different as time. you go along with it. Yeah. So if my story can help others even somewhat to, to deal with their diagnosis, and I've met, I've met lots of people because I've been diagnosed myself. And I'm in the public eye a little bit through podcasts and radio shows and that kind of thing a bit. So, like here. <laughs> yeah, like here, yeah. But I mean, I, my, my story is just one of thousands, you know, who get, of men who get diagnosed with different conditions every day. But I mean, if, if each of us makes is honest and forthright in, in how we're dealing with it and sharing the things that work for us, then hopefully life can be a little bit better for the generation coming ahead. No, look, thank you very much for that. And it is better for all of us because you share and you're with us and you're telling your story here with us today and for the work you do, especially uh, for men's health on the island of Ireland. Uh, thank you very much for coming on and being and Thanks to you, Larkin, for, for being such a great support to me over the years. I really do appreciate it. Well, look, go well and we'll talk to you soon again. Thanks, Larkin. Thanks very much. That's Dr. Noel Richardson, folks. And uh, look at two really remarkable stories and two remarkable men. Ordinary men, but remarkable in the responses to challenging issues um, and, and probably just a really good way to be able to mark and celebrate International Men's Day by bringing the visibility of such people and such men in. Um, there's another lovely man I want to introduce you to. His name is Owen Kernan. And you might know Owen. I have a few notes here. You could loads of notes on your own. If I'm, I've forgotten my notes because I'm just talking to people here now at this stage. But Owen, uh, you know, I came across you originally through International Men's Health Week. I met you through Collie Fowler and you were part and willing to be part of the partnership on promoting on the island of Ireland the story of men's health. And again, through a strengths based approach. Uh, but I also came in contact with you through Unspoken. And if people haven't seen that documentary, it's on the RT player. And there's going to be a link up to it here later on, because back in 2009, are 19 on you are not a well man, you know, anxiety and uh, mental health issues and uh, eating disorder and unspoken is about the eating disorders, especially in men. Um, and, uh, you know, I just watched it again very, very recently. It's a remarkable documentary, but it is 
a, a documentary about re recovery and finding connection and coming back into your life. Tell me about that. Tell me about especially, you know, knowing that you're not not well and just trying to find those connections where you can reach out and, and, and find that support that you did find, especially towards the end. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, it's it's a pleasure and a privilege to follow the the two last speakers um, and and to listen to their stories. I suppose for me, um, I could hear lots of different things in what in what both Noel and John said that I could relate to. Um, so there's a commonality between all of our stories, but then there's also unique elements to it as well. And I think. That's also what Unspoken shows that, you know, myself and and uh, Daniel and Cormac, who who both also participated in that story, um, Unspoken told three individual stories, but very much told uh, a story of how, you know, mental health, mental illness, eating disorders impact men in general in Ireland um, and how we're maybe not aware of it. Um, for me, I became ill very unknowingly. Um, I lived 36 years of a wonderful what I thought model of life. I was, you know, trying to achieve everything we're told to achieve, uh, trying to start a family, trying to find a, you know, decent career path, um, you know, get on the housing ladder, all those different things that you're told you're supposed to do in life, because if, you know, if you do those, you're going to do good and you're going to have a secure and solid life. Um, I found at the end of 36 years, I had none of those um, or felt I had none of those. Um, and that made me very scared, made me very worried. Um, made me feel valueless, unworthy, unlovable, um, everything, everything crap about myself, basically. Yeah. Um, and when I would stand alongside any other man on the street, on the beach, you know, in the supermarket, wherever, um, I felt like I was so much smaller than them. I, um, I felt like I and it was not anything they were doing. It was very much my own feeling about myself. Um, so as a result of that, then um, I went on a journey where I believed I was going to change myself. And, you know, that's a much longer story that we won't go into today. Um, but as a result of trying to change myself, I became very, very ill. Um, and the problem I discovered when I finally became aware to my illness was that I could not find anyone else who seemed to be like me. Um, the, the stereotype out there did not equal a middle aged heterosexual man dealing with an eating disorder. Um, and that was another very scary moment um, because, you know, you're, you're number one trying to deal with this new entity in your life, um, this new you know problem in your life that you're trying to learn everything about. And then you're worrying that, am I the only person in the world who's dealing with this? You know, um, and that's very, very scary. So I suppose part of my recovery journey um, and, and part of my treatment during that, I made a promise to myself um, because of the amount of knowledge that I learned, the amount of understanding I now have about how my mind works and how the world works to, to impact my mind that I made a decision that I was going to share that knowledge. And there's absolutely no point in me keeping it in my head. It's done me a world of good, um, but for sure, I would hope it might be able to do someone else a world of good, um, even if it's just one point, you know? In the documentary, Unspoken, um, what I thought was really powerful about it, first of all, it was, it was the way it was told, the story of three younger men, three men, um, and then coming into recovery by similar kind of paths. And one of the things that really was strong, I thought it was a really good documentary in highlighting key ways into recover. You spoke really powerfully about that ability to eventually reach out and and find especially the, the, the talking services where you could go in and begin to sit down and, and talk about your life and talk about the challenges that you had. And some of those messages you picked up about being a man that was elemental to your recovery. Wasn't that a really key part of it? A absolutely. And I will be at the other, the, I suppose to the caveat to all of that, and I'll be very upfront is the beginning of that process was so difficult um, for various different reasons. Number one, we don't talk as a society, you know, as a male society anyway, we, we don't really talk. So to relearn that, or sorry, not to relearn, to, to learn it for the, for the beginning, for the very beginning was something I'd never done before, you know, to, uh, being allowed to actually talk about how I was feeling. Um, um, and, and have that opportunity was something so strange and so new to me. But the other uh, very big uh, difficulty I had was actually finding the right person to talk to um, in the beginning, before I started very intensive treatment. Um, we did reach out to a number of different services, both public and private, um, and unfortunately uh, didn't have very successful results in the beginning. And that was very difficult to deal with because 
you know, your an eating disorder, as I ca- often talk about, becomes your best friend. Um, it mm-hmm. becomes the only person in the world you can trust. Um, and because it's, you know, essentially you're you're creating the results. So, you know, you can trust your own results. Um, and when someone asks you to give that up, it's a little bit like saying, you know, give up your best friend. You know, and, you know, if I asked you right now to give up your best friend, you wouldn't want to. You know, you'd be heartbroken to do that. Um, so to, to reach out for help in the beginning is very difficult. But then... I suppose the reactions I had to that from the different people I reached out to were not positive in the beginning. And I really had to uh, push through that both uh, myself, but also hugely with the support of my family and friends. Um, And and in particular, my partner and my parents. And if they were not there, I would be, it's very unlikely I'd be here talking to you today. Um, And that trusted circle who at times had to be hard on me, at times had to really push me hard um, to keep going, um, to get to, to finally get to who I call now my living angel, the one woman who I met. And that moment I sat in front of her in a room one day after my lowest, lowest, lowest point, uh, I just, I remember the sound of her voice. I don't remember anything we talked about, but I remember the sound of her voice. And that was the magic moment. That was the moment that kicked it all off. Um, but unfortunately, up until then, what had happened was I had kind of been kicked around a little bit from Billy to Jack and Billy hadn't spoken to Jack. So each time you spoke, each time you sat in front of a new person, you yeah. effectively re-traumatized yourself because you had to explain all your problems all over again and why you had found yourself at this point in your life. And then they would say, well, look, I unfortunately can't help you. And you'd be in floods of tears in front of them. And they'd just say, well, I can't help you. I'll pass it on to someone else. But eventually we found the right person and it does take perseverance. That's the one thing I will say, this whole process. And when I went into intensive treatment after that, you know, meeting that one individual, I I committed to going in for two weeks. I said, that's all I'm doing. Two weeks and I'm going to come out and I'm going to be fixed. And four years later, we're still managing to, you know, to, to work on some things. So, you know, it's a long process. Oh, and we're coming into land uh, for the time, unfortunately. But here, I'm looking at you now. And as I say, in unspoken, I could see where you were at your lowest day. But it's a challenging video to watch and just to say that to people. But it is recovery based and fantastic three men on the screen there in it watching it, you know. Um, for for maybe, you know, as you said, you, you've highlighted very clearly the messages we pick up as men, that it can be very isolation as far as that we don't get to the service What is your word as an advocate uh, for, I suppose, getting men out there to talk and use service? What's your word on International Men's Health Day or for it to say to men? uh, My my word is experiment. Um, I used to challenge myself because that was what the world told me to do. It told me to challenge myself and try new things. And that always implied success or failure. Um, And more often than not, I felt in my life failure. Um, And as a result, that that built up that message in my head of, being unworthy, unlovable, unvalued, invaluable, or not valuable. Um, so nowadays, instead of challenging myself, something I've learned is that I experiment. Um, and by experimenting, you either have a positive or a negative result, um, but you always learn. Even if it's a negative result, you will always be able to take some results for the next time you try and experiment with something. You don't fail. An experiment doesn't fail. By its nature, it will always produce something. Um, and that 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 result that it produces, you can take for the next, you know, the next iteration of what you want to try. And the only other thing I say is I, I've tried to wor- remove the word should from my language as well, because should is very much a, a word full of judgment. And, uh, you know, who is who gives anyone the right to tell us we should do something um, other than ourselves, you know. Um, and so I've tried to remove those or change, change my language in my life. Um, and that's helped me to to see a, a better path. Oh, and it's been a pleasure to have you here with us today. And thank you for making time to be here with us. I wasn't sure we'd be able to get you, but you put yourself out there and you said you'd come along and you're here. And again, for anybody who's interested in just even the world of men, and recognizing the journey and the nuances of especially through any kind of illness, I think that unspoken is really worth going and sitting down with and and watching because it's an incredible journey of um, just bravery and courage. So thank you for all your advocacy work and especially through Bodywise and through Men's Health Week and all the places that you turn up to support other men to find us. Thank you very much. It's a privilege, as I said, to be here. Thank you very much. Well, that's our own. And uh, again, another remarkable story. And as I say, I would recommend uh, if you want to find out more about what Owen has been doing uh, in relation to advocacy, 
unspoken is certainly worth watching. Now, we're going to our panel in a few moments time. But when I was talking to Noel earlier, we talked about the National Men's Health Training Programme. And as part of the National Men's Health Training Programme, there is a programme called Connecting with Men. It's the Engage Programme. Um, and it's a one day training. And people are always asking about this. It's rolled out across Ireland, across uh, all the different uh, HSE areas. And we have a team that are out there training. Uh, probably even today, there's people in rooms having the experience of the Engage National Men's Health Training Programme through this specific programme. And I'm going to ask you just to sit back and just draw a breath for a few moments. And we'll have a watch of this video because it'll tell you more about what the programme is. And you might need or would like to go on it at some stage uh, when it's in a place near you. So off it goes. Are men and boys not interested in looking after their own health? Or are we simply not offering them the right things in the right ways? If you're curious about the answer to this question and would like to explore practical strategies to help your organisation to engage more effectively with males, then you might be interested in a free one day workshop called Connecting with Men. The Republic of Ireland was the first country in the world to adopt the National Men's Health Policy. This highlighted the specific health issues facing men and boys, and it recognised the important role played by service providers in meeting these needs. It also acknowledged that these stakeholders require training and support. The Engage National Men's Health Training Programme was subsequently developed to assist organisations and service providers to build effective relationships with males of all ages in order to improve their health and their well-being. All the engaged content is rigorously field tested and evaluated and is evidence informed. Engage is spearheaded by a partnership comprised of South East Technological University, the Men's Development Network, HSE Health and Wellbeing and the Men's Health Forum in Ireland. The programme is underpinned by a range of core principles Three of the most important are that men are not a problem to be solved or fixed, but are indeed an asset to their families, friends, communities and society. Not all males are the same. There's a lot of diversity within this group and some are more at risk of health difficulties than others. There is always something, no matter how small, that can be done to improve the health of men and boys, if we choose to look for it. One of the key programmes within Engage is Connecting with Men. This free one-day workshop is offered to a broad range of service providers and practitioners. It provides an opportunity for participants to explore the world of males and to develop practical strategies for engaging with them around health and well-being issues. This workshop primarily focuses upon the engagement process, the why and the how of building relationships with men and boys. Engage workshops are delivered by facilitators who have graduated from a Training for Trainers programme and there are facilitators available across all the regions of Ireland. Connecting with men is facilitated through a reflective, interactive and conversational style. It draws upon participants' own professional and life experience and it focuses on a strengths-based approach. Here's what some past participants have said about the programme. If you are a service provider, a health practitioner, or an organisation that is seeking to engage more effectively with males of all ages, please check out Connecting with Men program at engagetraining.ie. Yes, folks, please do check it out, engagetraining.ie. It's really a really good day's training. And as it says on the video, it's relational, it's developmental, it's conversational, but there's huge evidence behind it. And it's a really, really good learning experience. And there's a lot of really positive um, feedback in relation to that. So, uh, so look, we're going to go to our panel here now. And uh, on our panel, uh, we have uh, three really good and remarkable men. The men who are coming up is we have Lawrence uh, Gahan, who's coming in from the West of Ireland. 
if you're there, Lawrence, to come in and say hello to me. Lawrence, says, I, I, I have a really long list of things that you've been about, Lawrence. I'm not going to go through it, but just to say you have lots of experience, 30 years experience in managing within the HSE. You've done a huge amount of work out there, especially in relation to community development. Yeah, a background in farming, interest in agriculture, and also you've been very much at the heart of things like Men on the Move and International Men's Health Week. And we're just so glad that you're here with us as well. Uh, we also have Stephen O'Connell. And Stephen is proof that uh, I suppose sometimes the difficulty can also lead to a really good opportunity because he started the football cooperative after moving into a place and wanting to make connections with other men in the area. And the football cooperative is doing a fantastic work as a social enterprise around bringing men together around football, but also building friendships and then, of course, we have Kevin Dogan, and Kevin has come all the way from Sure Start. He's up there, and he's been very much a champion across the north of Ireland and beyond in relation to parenting and fathering uh, and promoting the benefits of fathers and the impact we can have for the good uh, on our families, our communities, and our children. So, folks, you're really, really welcome, and thanks for joining us for our panel discussion. I think you'll agree, all of you, even just by nodding, the, the three people we've just heard have been remarkable in their stories and uh, uh, and and sharing so generously with us. Uh, Lawrence, can I come to you just first because we've just watched the video and I was with you uh, some time ago in Athlone where we had the training for trainers for connecting with men, rolling out the new group that are out there now training a really important program in relation to building capacity for service providers that you're very much involved in as well. Yeah, that's right, Lurk, and I really enjoyed that training. And I suppose over the past two years or so, post-COVID particularly, we've started to roll out the program. So we've had maybe, I don't know, maybe seven or eight programs now. We generally run it across Galway. I'm based here in Mayo, so we run it across Galway, Mayo, and Roscommon. And as you were saying there, Lurk, and it's a, it's a great uh, resource, the engaged training. You know, it brings in a lot of people, you know, who are engaged with men. And it, I suppose it's a ripple effect. The more and more trainers we have, the more messaging gets out and, the you know, the best practice gets out and um, I, th I think as um, it kind of you know um, as you were saying there in the video men men aren't a problem to be fixed you know and that we, we, that's part of the discussion of course around engage and looking at the strengths around men and also a very important point there in the video as well men are not the same so of course depending on your um, you know, not alone your background, age, ethnicity, you know, um, geographic spread. So there's huge variations there. But the, I think the Engage program is really good, you know, as, as a tool. And I'd highly recommend people to uh, come on the training if they haven't done so. OK, thanks, Lawrence. Now, all of you are on the panel today because it is International Men's Day. And in one way or another, you're all advocates for different aspects of engaging with men. And Lawrence, you're very much in relation, come to it again in a few moments, about the partnering, you know, greater than the sum of the parts, as Noel was saying. But Stephen, yourself, you know, a man that was just out, loved a bit of sport, loved football, and, you know, a move in your life and you discover you're outside of your own uh, place of comfort. And uh, outside of your own place of comfort and said, try to find connections, because like Lawrence was talking about there a few moments ago, as men, sometimes we can be maybe more isolationist. But you came up with this idea for men and middle aged men, especially, say, to make the connections. Tell us a tiny bit about that as as an advocate for that kind of connection. Yeah, I guess it came from a personal need because I just moved to Dublin and while well, I knew people from my homeland or whatever were around there that were living in Dublin, it's a vast place and, and getting to meet them often was difficult and not at all happening. So I guess for me, you know, to keep up your health, you want to get physical activity. And I guess somewhere along the line, I realized that footpath is not my friend. I'd much rather chase the ball. That's what I was born and raised on from school and club and the community. So I guess it was on a walk one evening where the kind of beautiful astroturf pitch stood so fully free and you know at eight o'clock or so in the evening I found that hard hard to understand why there wasn't many people getting into physical activity out on that pitch and and from that triggered me just to kind of engage with the pitch venue owner and look at getting a game together and that's where you had the kind of kind of overwhelming amount of men that came out from the few different posters from community notice boards to social media saying yeah I'm open if this is the, if the request is to be available um flexibly for a game of football and you know to you know all fitness levels all abilities and it's in my community i'm interested so 
it grew from a small acorn and we def definitely kind of took a lot of evidence that guys were taking benefit from it yeah and looked about how we could make it more sophisticated and more engage more men and make the coordination of it all easier very good um, and and kevin just to bring you into the conversation as well for many years you have been very much advocating especially for the role of dads in the lives of our children and going back to what the other two speakers were talking about you know making those connections like you know like sport and dads can be a really great way into building a relationship building that rapport with our children your own experience then as that you know what what, what have you learned yourself in relation to uh, our impact in the positive international men's day coming up what difference do we make in the lives of our children either through sport or through connections or whatever it might be yeah, well, I think I think particularly in the early years, it's it's absolutely massive. But I think it, it's always started with the assumption that men won't or men can't have an impact. With those picking up as Stephen said, there's probably a perception in, in Ireland until they're ready to pull on a jersey. You know, dads don't have a role historically until they pick up a football and they're ready. But I suppose the importance of the early years and what we have done, uh, particularly up north around sort of, you know, big scale initiatives like the Sure Start programme, is look at that dad's, you know, role right from the antenatal stage, you know, to begin those really important messages of skin to skin contact that we naturally give mum, but we also give father and then build that up really, particularly the, the impact that dads have a really strong impact on children's speech and language development. We know that if you if you Google any of the research, there's, there's endless amount of research, particularly around speech and language that dads reading to their children actually has a, a more significant impact actually than mum reading to their children. And it's twofold, I suppose it's the benefit for the child, but also a lot of the sort of research was shown now the benefit it has for dad um, in terms of his mental health and well-being and his attachment and his grounding uh, as well. But we see that in a lot of our communities, we see it particularly in sort of a post-conflict in Northern Ireland, where the assumption is dads were a negative role in, in young people or in society's life. But we move forward, particularly starting in the, youth, the, the early years. You see that you know the very fundamental positive impacts fathers can have, role models for young boys, self-esteem for for young girls. The, the benefits are endless. And tell me this, Kevin, can I stay with you for a moment? Just because of what Lawrence and Stephen have said as well, you know, uh, you know, sport can be a great conduit, not for everybody, but it needn't be sport. It can be the outdoors, like Men on the Move was a program that ran with middle-aged men. It was outdoors with activities, it was a social context to it. And Stephen as well, I'm going to ask Stephen a few moments, how do you stop men being competitive on that uh, AstroTurf, you know what I mean? Because we can be inclined to, you know, it, what are the ways in, in your experience, Kevin, in relation to us as men, to be able to spend really good, genuine time in the company of our children and having that benefit? I think some of it's really quite basic, Lorcan, when it comes to offering services, actually addressing and, and asking dads, do they want to attend? I think a lot of services start with the notion that men won't or can't. Mm -hmm. um, some subtle things we have learned over the years, around sort of our early years programs, uh, mums are maybe a bit more tuned or emotionally, you know, cued into have a group's called Wriggles and Wiggles, but we've kind of learned over the years, if it's a physical play program for dads, you yeah. call it a physical play. So some of it comes from the very, basic how how we ask men want the run seal they want exactly what it says on the tin in terms of engaging with their children but what we have learned you know it's it's not just the sport it's not just the the sort of the physical play that dads would engage in if you're building a relationship and you're physically asking them we have dads packed out in baby massage classes for yeah. example at um, a very very young age and that level of bond and an attachment you know reaps you know benefits 20 30 40 years later so yeah. it, i think a lot of it is don't assume what men won't do they will probably, they will do 99.99% of what mums are doing if they're targeted, if they're asked and, and if services are flexible. And then that's where the real benefits when you're putting that as a positive role model and not just, you know, somebody that has to be a boat on to a lot of the services you're offering. Lawrence, is that your experience as well? You know, for us as men, like you know, like Kevin is saying there, you know, that there's, there's really good and creative ways that we can work with and for men and especially maybe engage us more in family and with children. Mm. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. And I think um, we need to be quite flexible, you know, and innovative, you know, uh, you know, uh, I think looking back over the years that I've been involved in different things, you know, whether it's um, men's shed, supporting men's sheds, men on the move or, you know, um, engaged training or farmer's health or going to marts or, you know, going to the workplace. It's, uh, you, I think we have to be quite flexible and, you know, sometimes, 
it's about using the language and using sort of practical skills, you know. So, you know, words like being sort of task oriented, you know, in terms of the language we use, how we attract men, you know, even simple things like in terms of the language we use or the, the time or the location and, you know, uh, the fact that um, men like coming together, actually, you know, if the right environment is created and it has to be kind of, you know, welcoming, safe. And, you know, certain basic principles and then, you know, as well as that, using maybe personalities, if you can, we found that if you use, if we are, if you have a sporting personality or a leader in the community who sort of promotes this, it's a great, a great attraction, you know, that's part of the success of the Men on the Move initiative, which was kind of miraculous, really, how it automatically attracted the right men and you know, a very simple initiative, but the effect of it has been enormous in terms of the language that we used and things like the time of year as well and and uh, the location and the nature of it and how you actually set it up. So, you know, there's a lot of learning now, I suppose, on, around that. And that's becoming more, you know, if we can transfer this learning and, you know, some of the models and some of the things there, Kevin is saying is th 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 that could be so critical. Some of that messaging we have there around fathers and uh, those relationships, uh, you know, and that's not widely understood, I think. So there's a lot of education, I think, we can do around all of that. Yeah. Stephen, I'm going to come back to you in a moment, but I just want to go back to Kevin for a moment just to say, Kevin, you know, th this program or this webinar is focused on the positive aspects of masculinity. So, and I said at the very top of the program, I was in like, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Is in your experience, and you're a long time in there kind of championing the role of fathers. You know, is there more visibility? Have we more models of this is what it looks like? There's a lot more dads that were much more interactive with our kids and we are responding in really positive ways. It does around positive masculinity. Very much so. We're, we're seeing, I suppose, that the very positive aspect of here in a lot of our services, for example, like Sure Start, you know, 35% of all dads that were registered with us last year attended at least one service. Now, you yeah. consider a lot of those men are, are working Monday to Friday, nine to five, and the stress and pressure and a lot of the children are extremely young. It's showing how active and engaged they are. And that's starting from a base of zero. I think probably with a big barrier still remains around visibility in the early years now would have a wider remit for childcare is actually in the workforce. Yeah. Um, and that remains a challenge where pay is extremely low in the early year sector. We have uh, 1,200 sure start staff and about eight or nine men employed. Yeah. But the ethos of father's work is extremely well embedded yeah. i think the next big jump for positivity is more male role models whether it be in the early years through on into primary teaching as well and the more we can bring men into the workforce i think it normalizes men full stop in children's lives well done yeah and stephen like you know kevin is talking about I suppose we're talking about modeling there your own initiative you know it starts out of it's an advocacy role now and it's a modeling as well of you know, bringing those men who maybe have dropped off from being kind of connected to some kind of physical activity, in your case, football, you know, the, to advocate for that. Was it challenging to begin with? I know f football might feel like it's low hanging fruit. You'll get certain people that will come along. But did people look at you and say, what are you about? Like, or did, was it easy to get it going because of the social connection the guys knew they'd have out of it? Um, I think for me, I guess, to go back on the competitive nature of football and is definitely there. I think um men more than anything given a football will be more competitive than he, than than they think they can be. So I think we respect that and I think it was easy kinda kinda introduce the games to the men as they got to the pitches, but there was a definitely a kind of a a role modeling from myself and the other game coordinators make sure that you know the game experience was rich for everyone and we could see the benefits of it physically, mentally, and socially. And I, I think we, what we're trying to see is through the academic research, we're, we're, we're kind of measuring that impact that currently. Um, I think the evidence is there. I think, but what we really we, that getting physically active can improve your health. I think. What's unknown is the social connectivity that, that can evolve from playing something as simple as football and getting off the couch. Yeah. Um, the men now know it themselves, especially I think, you know, while while COVID was COVID, I think we, we got to build up a pool of people that, you know, were accessible or available on whatever channel you you needed across COVID. So you had that network. Yeah. And yeah. I guess that respect, that challenge maybe grew people's respect for what the football had served them when it was gone to really missed it that social connection and really 
Yeah, I could imagine that. Absolutely. Maybe, very much so. Uh, Lawrence, one of the reasons I'd asked you, would you come on here today? And I think Kevin has been very much part of it as well across North River. You know, greater than the sum of the parts has come up a few times here today. For yourself in any of the work we're trying to do as advocates for men, you know, whether it's around parenting, fathering, you know, engaging men in community, partnering is really, really in incredible. And I know out West, Lawrence, last year for International Men's Week, as we call it, Health Week, we had, you know, we had so many things that happened out there. But that's because you're a conduit to make that happen. You're an advocate for that. That's really, really important, isn't it? Splendid isolation doesn't serve anybody great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly, uh, Lurkin, I think. And, you know, I think last year, uh, in there, I was talking to, to Colin Fowler last year, and he, he uh, you know, just looking for ideas around um, Men's Health Week, maybe around March or April, you know, and I, I think Men's Health Week is a great opportunity to raise awareness, to create connectivity and bring more partners on. So he was suggesting perhaps traditionally in the past, we might have gone for a few big events, you know, in a few towns or gone for some online events like this. So last year, I tried a different approach. So in each county, then we invited partners to become on to come on board, say from March onwards. And I was amazed really at the extent and the number of partner organizations that came on board. And then each county, as it were, had a structure in terms of each county in Mayo and Galway and Roscommon, they came up with a series of events. So in the end, we had about 70 or 80 events taking part um, uh, during that week. And we had a whole lot of partners involved, maybe about um, 50, 70 or 80 partners involved a whole across a whole range of organizations you know whether it's from education voluntary statutory sporting organizations you know county councils leader companies libraries uh, the farming communities some private organizations there as well in terms of Oriva and uh, you know in terms of agriculture and chagas and all that so uh, i i i was kind of amazed really at the level of goodwill that was out there Yes. To, and, and then, so for instance, in a whole load of towns, maybe 30 or 40 towns and villages, you know, there was, it could range from a coffee morning to a, a men's health morning with health checks, it could range to a walk, it could range to the golf club doing something, the gym, inviting people to come in for taster events, you know, the library having talks and events. And we had a lot of health screening then going on as well. And we had a great partnership here with Cree in the west of ireland you know in terms of and we we, we had actually f physical health checks for over 200 men at places like marts yeah. community centers and hard to reach groups you know i think that's the key thing if we can bring the services and bring these messages to the actual locations whether it's the sports club the shopping center or the mart or the uh, the gea club you know i think that's really the, some of the key messaging i think and Kevin, you've been doing the same because, you know, when you talk about the social care board, the strategic planning, it is, you know, you're very much part of, you know, not one person in the corner doing this, but growing those partnerships through Sure Start in North of Ireland and across it. That's been elemental. Yeah, yeah very much. So, Lorcan, like there's 38 projects across the north here um, mm -hmm. in the top 25 percent most deprived areas but there's over 50 partners in some shape or form either employing partners or lead bodies within those projects all delivering the services on the ground and the big ethos we have always had in terms of where the services are based both for mum and dad that they're within pram pushing distance of mum or dad and and that's really key you know we're using all the we have some cases where we have the head office in the inverted commas but you're in delivering the services to dads in the GA hall, the orange hall, the church, you know, wherever we can get a room, they're they're in delivering it. And it's night on day and it's at the weekend. It's is it, you know, Lawrence is picking up is that ability to adapt. Um, we're benefiting hugely, I think, as well from the shape of men's working patterns. You know, you are starting to see a change of that. It's you know, it's not just the nine to five, you've men working all sorts of hours and for childcare costs also we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, mom and dad's doing split shifts. So sometimes for a lot of our service, you are seeing dad is the person that might be available at Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning because he's working an evening shift in a, in a certain job or profession. So that ability to be flexible and offer services as much as possible and do both offer mixed groups in terms of for mom and dad and then do the dad specific work as well seems to work because different men like different audiences. You know what I mean? Some only like all men's group. Some are much more comfortable coming in and mixing with sort of mum and dad's group. So it's it's that flexibility, both geographically and also sort of in the makeup of your groups to try and target as many as possible. 
Yeah, Kevin, tell me this in, in your experience over the years. And as I say, you've been in, in, in the midst of it for a long time, you know, and it, it's been slow and challenging work, I know, for you to, to, to even the visibility of dads and the positive aspects of our lives and what we bring. It has to be a game changer anywhere. Was there something that you said, you know, when this happened, whether it was in policy or research or in practice, that some said, God, this this actually is a really good way of it for, for, for men themselves, maybe even first time dads. You know, we often, I know Lawrence have talked to this with, with Lawrence about this before, you know, first time dads is a super opportunity to engage, not just in relation for family, but for health. You know, maybe a first time dad might want to give up the smokes or give up the beer because he doesn't want to bring it around the house. You know what I mean? There's opportunities there. Have you seen those kind of things coming in as part of, you know, the positive aspects of how we can actually encourage positive masculinities and living a really... Pro probably, probably two sides I've sort of seen strong. I think one, we're benefiting from a generational change, do you know what I mean? Particularly for, for, for dads under 40 in particular. You know, it's, it's normalised that they will be very active you know what I mean? So that sort of macho image of sort of you know, leaving the, the partner with the kids and going out, that has gone away. One of the positive aspects probably in social media is mm -hmm. how upfront a lot of dads, young men, full stop are, are with pictures and, and sharing sort of images of themselves with their children. So it is seen as much more of a man's job nowadays in 2023 to be very active in their children's lives where if you drop back to sort of 1970s or 1980s Ireland, you know, it, it wouldn't have been something that was expected of men so i think a lot more of the positive yes there's a lot of toxic masculinity and a lot of highlighting of the negativity yes. you know of, of males but i think there's much more positive role models whether it's you know within local ga clubs within social media whatever it is men and children are much more visible together and then i think for a few of us who have you know been in the trenches for a while i think you're starting to see the the expectation raising across services, whether it's core services and health or education, that you're able to push and say, but what about dads? But what about men? And there's much more of that advocacy work has paid off, I think, by, by sort of a collection of people on the ground role modeling that it can be done if you if you offer dads the opportunity, they will engage in exactly the same way as that mums will engage. Well, if you see it, you can be it, literally. That's the way it works. Yeah. So, folks, we are coming in a kind of to the last part of the, the interview. And just with your, you know, maybe this is a heart answer. And Stephen, what International Men's Day, what is it you would hope, you know, in your experience as advocates, what is it you would hope for for men uh, that would be good and positive in relation to even maybe the roles you're in already um, or, or something else? Is there something that for International Men's Day you would say, I would hope this would be the case? And this is where we'd be in a couple of years' time. Steve, for yourself, your hopes for the, the football cooperative, you know, what's your what's your heartfelt hope for it as, as an initiative and a social enterprise? I think we're still gathering our case for sport and, and measuring our impact is, is where we have been over the last couple of years. But moving forward, it is making the model robust enough to bring football to more communities the way we do it. And to do that successfully, you need more men to volunteer and to kind of grasp that opportunity that you know this may perceive to be extra work but it can return massive more in terms of your own you know self-worth the connectedness the, the empowerment it gives you and and also like some professional development as well like certainly coordinating a group of people brings itself many you know different challenges but op op opportunities as well so I, I think for anyone out there that's been thinking about getting active or getting behind an endeavor, go for it because you know the opportunity is absolutely something that will return itself in spades. Thanks very much, Steve. And for yourself, Lawrence, your call to action is there something you'd wish for or wish for men to get involved in, or what's your call? To yeah, action? well, just thinking of it there, I suppose you know, as as uh, during earlier in the. In the introduction there, you were talking about, you know, Ireland is quite to the forefront of this in terms of policy and education and all of that. So quite a lot has happened. I suppose I was thinking of three elements probably under, there's still a lot around awareness, you know, to create awareness around men's health generally and the opportunities it presents and, and you know, that culture, I think. And secondly, then under partnership, I think, is the other key thing. So engaging more and more partners, you know, this is all about 
partnership, you know, as I was saying there during Men's Health Week or whenever, it's all about having many and many and many partner organizations. So I think if we could develop that a bit more, just maybe in terms of, um, it is quite good nationally, but to bring that to the regions then and bring it, say in the HSC where I'm working, if that could come to the different community health organizations and bring, bring it down to county level, and thirdly, then I think in terms of education, you know, I think there's still quite a bit in terms of education yeah. to go back to the, um, uh, was it John's story at the beginning in terms of uh, cancer and awareness and, Thanks, you know, yeah. er early intervention. So I think there's still quite a piece, quite a lot going on there in terms of, you know, for instance, um, prostate and some of the key uh, health challenges, but still quite a lot to do there. And I think getting in, with younger men, even maybe getting in from the the, the, the TY program, or getting in, you know, and into organisations. So it's still quite a quite a bit to do there, I think. Okay, thank you. And very finally, just a word, Kevin. We're running on time here. What are yourself, um, what what's what's in the heart? As to say, you come to the end. Is there something yourself that you would wish? Yeah, prob probably two quick ones. I, I in terms of a service wise, I would love to see a world where we didn't even say fathers work because it's so normal and so mainstream because we don't say mother's work. Um, so I'd love to see that sort of strong come that we don't even need to use that title. And I think for men and fathers, and I suppose having three kids myself, I think we're all sort of men are driven by this notion of legacies and what they leave behind. And I think it's a powerful message. And, and for all men, I would say, you know, the first 1,000 days of children's lives is the most important uh, in, in shaping their entire future. So the greatest legacy men can have is being active in the early years in the first thousand days and that'll reap a reward and legacy far greater than anything you do if you shape your children's lives in the first thousand days that's a lovely word to, to end on that invitation to the first thousand days and then stay as well but really really good folks and um, kevin lawrence and stephen thanks for being with us here on the panel and thanks for marking international men's day with us really really appreciated we're running on time and I want to bring in our good friend uh, Fergal for the last part of our day. Just thanks to our other three people as well, John Owen and Noel, who were with us earlier on. Um, and uh, I wish everybody uh, a peaceful International Men's Day and wherever you are, mind yourself. And I'm going to hand over to Fergal just to bring you up to speed and all other things. So go well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorcan. And uh, well done again on chairing another great webinar. I have just a few, uh, three or four things to highlight. And I, first of all, I suppose I want to thank all the speakers today. Great to hear the advocates about their learning and the first-hand experiences. And I love to finish there about the fathers, the first thousand days. That's a great call out. Um, and uh, so appreciation to Stephen, Kevin and Lawrence and earlier Noel, Owen and John. In terms of the, the prostate cancer, I want to highlight something in particular. And we put the links to all this information in the follow-up email. But the, uh, our colleagues in the HSC National Cancer Control Programme recently published a guide um, uh, around checking your prostate. And they put a lot of time into that, trying to make it user friendly. And we'd love you to have a look at that. And I'd, I'd appreciate if you, if you make a point of, of looking at that or sharing it with anybody you think about might get some good use out of it. John spoke so well. And, and quoting people like Laura Brennan and Vicky Field and really hit his messages home about engaging with others and that kind of social support that he got um, and living living your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we'll also share the link to the unspoken documentary that Owen spoke about. And um, as always, Noel, uh, much appreciated sharing your personal experience and your professional experience. Last of all, I suppose, in terms of, you know, the one of the big priorities for the HSC now at this time of year is it's just about winter wellness, minding yourself. It's not a men's health message in particular, but like you have a, men in particular can play a big role in this, in their families, in the communities, looking out for yourself and looking out for others. But with all these viruses and, and things kind of on the move now in the winter, we know well the sicknesses goes up, everything from the flu to COVID. Um, and there's vaccines available for flu and COVID. I'd encourage people uh, to get those, if, especially if they're older or, or any underlying condition. I know this is a basic message, but it is very, very important at this time of year to keep people out of the health services um, or, you know, use the health services on an only kind of high needs basis. So um, I hope that you just kind of consider that, um, you know, if you can and if you need to uh, with yourself or with other people in your family or your network, encourage them to get, you know, the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine in particular, and then get your other medicines in that, you know, well, there may be sickness in your house. 
you can guarantee if you have a house with children in it that there's going to be some sickness in there. So get some of those medicines that you know you're going to have to lean on. I know it's it's a pretty boring message, but it is definitely something that will will give you a crutch in 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 some of these days coming in in the in the winter months. And and that's about it. We really appreciate your engaging with the the men's health series of webinars. As as Larkin mentioned, today's webinar is is kind of it's an ongoing part. You know, we've had webinars now since late since twenty twenty, and all those webinars are up on our YouTube channel, um, the HSC Health and Wellbeing YouTube channel, and uh, with some great uh, podcasts up there this year that we did around men's health um, as well. But finally, uh, and we hope I suppose to see you next year on on our webinar series, but. Finally, I just want to wish everybody a happy Christmas and a happy new year. And thanks so much for your support of the men's health work. Thank you.